Now, when Sambalat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what they are building. If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sambala and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they plotted, and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is falling. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemy said, they will not know or see till we come among them to kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known and to us, to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows and coats of mail and the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread and we are separated on the wall far from one another and the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there our God will fight for us so we labored at the work and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out I also said to the people at the time let every man and his servant pass a night within Jerusalem that they may be a guard for us night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took our clo clothes, each kept his weapon at his right hand. I'm sure the Lord will bless that reading today. Thank you, Cami. Um, Gordon, I'll just invite you to come up now and to share God's word with us. Thank you, Gordon. I need the clicker. Uh, 
Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. It's been a lovely time so far, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. It's been a lovely time this morning. Bobby's prayer was beautiful, powerful. And Lewis's thoughts uh, on Remembrance Sunday were very moving, very moving. I'll take this off. <laughs> yes, it will. It's been a lovely time so far. Let's trust that continues. Let's just pray and ask the Lord to help me and help each of us as we hear. Father, we thank you for our time together now. We thank you for your word once again. Father, we pray the Holy Spirit would be our aid. We open our hearts, both preacher and listener. Lord, that you would speak today. Uh, and where you speak, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit says into the core of our being. That you would plant your word. You would uh, make room for your word in our hearts, in our being. That we would be shaped and molded according to the word of God. And that this would be to your glory, Father. And our lives would be changed. This new life that you have won for us in the cross, Lord Jesus. That you rose again. That we might share with you as you live in us. So let us live a new life to your glory. Uh, we praise you, O oh God, for all of this. And think too of those who laid down their lives in these dreadful conflicts. What are we doing with all of this freedom? What are we doing with all of this blood purchased liberty. Oh God, let us know your will for our lives and live to the highest. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've had our Bible reading. The summary so far of what we've seen, just very quickly again, uh, the summary is going to increase, isn't it, as we go through week by week. But very briefly, Nehemiah in chapter one, we saw him back in captivity, in exile, and when news came back of how poorly Israel was doing back in the motherland, they, uh, he was heartbroken, and God gave him a vision to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and rebuild the city. In chapter 2, we see that he does that very thing. The king gives him permission to go, and he goes back and he shares his vision with the people who are already back there. He shares his vision with those who have gone back with him. And as one mind, as one, one man, they agree to the rebuilding process. Even though the walls of Jerusalem have been destroyed for many, many decades, and the place is just a mound of rubble. Chapter 3, we saw how Nehemiah organizes that. And he organizes the builders. He organizes families to build together. He organizes people to build opposite to where they're living, which we saw from Jim last time was a great incentive to make sure that your building was well done and that the wall was solid where the enemy might try to break through to attack your own home or your own family. So Nehemiah was a wise organizer, a great strategist. Uh, and we've seen that in our three chapters this far. Today, we will consider this big theme of opposition and discouragement. Uh, and we'll see that there are words of ridicule. There comes then the threat of attack. And then we see that there are weaknesses within the community. And in the end, we'll see how Nehemiah wins the day and deals with all of that in the way that God would have him do so. This guy is uh, James, called James Quick Tillis. He was he contended for the heavyweight title of the world in 1981. Uh, he's fought Mike Tyson and other well-known personalities. Uh, it says of him that former heavyweight boxer James Tillis is a cowboy, which you can see, uh, from Oklahoma, who fought out of Chicago. That was his home boxing club in the early 1980s. He still remembers his first day in Windy City uh, in Chicago after his arrival, arrival from Tulsa. He says, I got off the bus with two cardboard suitcases under uh, my arms in downtown Chicago, nothing to my name, and I stopped in front of the Sears Tower. I put my suitcases down and I looked up at the tower and I said to myself, I'm going to conquer Chicago. And when I looked down, the suitcases were gone. <laughs> <laughs> Some little Chicago scallywag. 
had left him with nothing. And it was a long climb in his story from their uh, one discouragement after another till he fought for the heavyweight championship of the world. So words that ridicule, uh, verse one, when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed and he ridiculed the Jews. He ridiculed the Jews. I want us to make the point right away that true advancement of God's work brings opposition from God's enemies. Uh, they had been no problem with uh, Sanballat and his cohorts to this point, while Jerusalem lay in rubble. Uh, in a sense, repatriation of the Jews from Iran, from Babylon, from the citadel of Susa, where uh, Nehemiah came back from. That was fine. They came back to their own land. And Sanballat was uh, an official appointed by the king of Babylon for the Samaria uh, Judean area a bit like Pontius Pilate was in the Roman Empire during the days of Jesus. So he was the, the, the heat bummer in this whole setup, uh, and he was watching what was going on. But for him, repatriation was one thing, but reconstruction was quite another. That was a step too far. And it made me think that Satan, you know, loves a ruined church. Satan loves the church to be uh, well attended as long as it remains in ruins like Jerusalem was a ruined community. Uh, and we see a ruined church in the, the church of, of Laodicea, that town uh, that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 3, who thought they were doing so well, but actually their church was in ruins, so to speak. But Satan rises to oppose true faith in action, where the Holy Spirit is working through God's people, as Bobby prayed this morning. The enemy of souls rises up because he knows that where God is at work among his people, there will be power to change the world, power to change communities, to change souls, power to save and transform, power to bring glory to God. And Satan's chief purpose is to erode and eradicate, to annul the glory of God that comes from his people. So Satan rises up where uh, the Holy Spirit is at work, where there's a rebuilding of the church in process. Words of ridicule, verse 2. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, Sanballat said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And he uses this expression at several times, will they? Will they? Will they? He's asking a rhetorical question that is full of ridicule because his implied answer is, of course they won't. Of course they can't. They're hopeless. These Jews are useless. They've been here for decades and they've done absolutely nothing with their own city. And that, of course, was what broke Nehemiah's heart in the first place. Ridicule in the mouth of anyone who chooses to ridicule others it really it is a means to massage the ego. It's very easy. It's utterly godless. And it puts others down in such a way that it lifts up the person doing the ridicule, uh, offering the ridicule. It makes us feel better when we can put other people down and laugh at their efforts, laugh at their something that's wrong with them. We, we, and, and words come out our mouth which ridicule others, and it makes us feel a bit better about ourselves. It is utterly ungodly. It is utterly of the flesh. And we should be those who avoid putting ridicule on our lips because we are not saved to ridicule. We are saved to speak words of blessing and encouragement. The problem with Satan's work as he ridicules you and I through the lips of others is that sometimes there's a grain of truth in it. Isn't it the hardest uh, accusations to refute when there's a grain of truth in them? We know that generally speaking, we're innocent, but we feel that gripping in our gut when there's a grain of truth that's leveled against us and somebody pins us on it in a malicious, ridiculing way. And of course, in this sense, the Jews were feeble. They were a disorganized community. They had no national religion in place. Their city, their national city, the capital of their uh, civil power and religious power was in utter 
ruins uh, and they were weak. So there was truth in what Sanballat was saying. Uh, will they finish in a day? Some commentator said they, he, he saw them working really hard and said, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to finish the whole thing in one day? And of course they couldn't. There was truth in what he was saying. And of course, there is no effort at this point from Sanballat to physically intervene to stop the building. And again, that's because he genuinely thought there was no chance of them succeeding. He thought there would be no chance of them succeeding. They just stood and looked on and ridiculed the poverty of the spectacle before them. <clears throat> Spurgeon says, the devil does not make a fire with one stick, <laughs> as only Spurgeon can. San Ballot had an accomplice. Verse 3, Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, he was his lackey, he was his helper, he was the man who would bear uh, uh, anything that needed uh, carried for San Ballot. And he said, what they are building, even a fox climbing up in it would break down their wall of stone. Even a fox, what he's meaning is not by the stealth of the fox, but even the weight of a fox climbing on this paltry effort of the Jews would break it down. And of course, if you know a fox, a fox is all fur. There's no weight in a fox at all. It was a very apt expression to ridicule the, the poverty of the builder's effort. But Psalm 1 verse 1 says, Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. What we see into here is the counsel of the wicked. Nor do they set foot on the path of sinners, hallelujah, or sit in the seat of mockers, of those who ridicule. God's blessing is upon us when we distance ourselves from that wicked and corrupt way of life. We do well to bear these things in mind. We come secondly then to the threat of attack. We see that Nehemiah presses on with the work uh, and words of ridicule turn into this threat of attack. Verse 7, but when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead, so they've had all this ridicule, but Nehemiah says, come on, heads down, keep the building going. Uh, and when they heard that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. We heard in the earlier verse that they were angry. Now the Holy Spirit puts in that they are very angry and things move up a gear. The greater the work of God, the greater the enemy roars. I say again, Satan is happy to let a church which is asleep in the light sleep on gently slumbering its life away. Satan will not interfere. He will not rouse. He will not stir us. But when we put our hand to the plow in Jesus' name to do the work of God in the power of the Holy Spirit, Satan is, uh, mobilizes his forces to engage with us, to oppose us, lest God gets the glory. God, Satan's great aim is not simply the destruction of the church or the, the destruction of human souls that people would fail to be saved. Satan's great aim is the annulling of the glory of God in the pinnacle of his creation, mankind. That is Satan's desire. And so he attacks the church for which Jesus gave his blood, as we've heard this morning. And he's delighted when the church lies in ruins, something to think about. If we encounter no spiritual opposition to our personal Christian service, we may have reason to ask, am I living in the power of the Holy Spirit as I ought to be? In other words, if the devil pays you no attention, are we really working together at the building process that God would have us engaged in, spiritually speaking? Does the enemy know your name in hell? Do you make the devil tremble 
when he hears your prayers. Remember, nothing effectual for God is done apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. Nothing effectual for God is that we can do a lot. We can run events like this and with very clever technology. But nothing effectual for God is done without it being from and through the power of the Holy Spirit among his people. And here's the thing. God gives his spirit to those who ask him. Are we a spirit-filled community? Are we full of the life of our God and King? Jesus said, if you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask the Lord today to fill you afresh, to equip you for ministry, to make you powerful in the work of God, so that Satan has something to worry about when he hears the name Bethesda Christian Fellowship. That's who we are. Verse 8, we see the ridicule gives way to violent plot. <clears throat> Verse 8 says, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. <clears throat> I can only imagine how great the level of fear, excuse me, <clears throat> I don't know if a glass of water is possible in these days, but if there was one available, that would be good. <clears throat> The level of fear and anxiety among the Jews was very high. Um, can you imagine what it was like for folks to be hearing these threats? And of course, they made their threats very public. It's likely that they wrote down and passed into the city what they were planning so that people would be made, made aware um, of just how real the, the danger was. And... Uh, that's, uh, you know, I, I, you can only imagine how, how difficult it was to be in Jerusalem in these days. Thank you very much. Evil plotting against the people of God uh, remarkably unifies the ranks of the wicked. These guys would ordinarily be at each other's throats. But when Satan's on the move, you find that wicked people discover a unity <laughs> that very often is foreign in the church of Jesus Christ. They had, they had a tremendous unity in their plotting to overcome the Jews in their efforts. But Psalm 22, 11 says, though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. They will not succeed. Here's the thing. Here's the context by which we can grasp this promise. When we're in the will of God, when we have surrendered to Christ, when we're saying, Lord, lead me in my life, fill me with your spirit, use me in your purposes. Let me not be a source of ridicule, but a, a channel of encouragement to bless my brothers and sisters. Let me be someone who, who shows the gospel of Christ to the unsaved community. Then you will know that though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. For in the will of God, with the commission of God, we become indestructible in his purpose. In his purpose, we will overcome. We will overcome. And we can believe that as we are the people God wants us to be, doing the work God wants us to do, Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We need to find that mission. We need to sign up to that task, that rebuilding. Lord, show me your will for my life, lest the short day of life passes me by. And I'm still asleep in the light. Then we see the weaknesses within, thirdly. Verse 10, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot build the wall. So at the same time that the enemy's threats were moving up a gear, they were growing stronger, the intimidation tactics were getting greater, the people of God were feeling weaker and weaker. 
uh, the task seemed too great for them. They said, we cannot rebuild the wall. How would you lead that? How would you like to lead that team? Right, guys, we've got a job to do today. Let's get to it. No, no, no. We cannot do this. It's too much for us. Uh, and they were talking themselves into defeat. We see weaknesses within the community of faith. There was too much rubble. You know, it struck me that sometimes in the life of church, we have to go backwards before we can really go forward. Sometimes there has to be decline or pruning under, you know, God's good hand before we begin to grow again and blossom again and sprout again and expand the way God wants us to. And in this case, they had to clear the rubble, clear the decks, uh, which was exhausting work before they saw one new stone in the right place. It was dispiriting work, and they were overcome by it. Verse 11 says, also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and we will kill them and put an end to their work. This is them quoting what the enemies have said. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, uh, this was the translation I was using, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So some within the Jewish community kept telling Nehemiah, wherever you turn, they will attack us. How encouraging is that? By the way, Nehemiah, I've just heard that wherever you go, they're coming for you, boy. Thanks very much, says Nehemiah. You know. uh, by the way, Nehemiah, have you heard they're coming for you? Yeah, they're coming. So there was a huge amount of, Nehemiah was under tremendous pressure, and he would hear all sorts of discouragement from his own people. And, and have you ever worked in a team like that, where the people who are supposed to be working with you are able to point out why it's never going to work. <laughs> oh, Lord, preserve us, strengthen us. Where's our faith gone? It can easily happen, but we have to be careful that we do not walk by sight. What are we to walk by? Faith, faith, faith. So we see the weaknesses within. I summarize them again. Some were creating panic. Some were telling Nehemiah he would be killed. Some were physically exhausted and weak. Some believed the task itself was impossible. God said to the Apostle Paul, my grace. <laughs> grace is such a soft word. It doesn't feel very powerful, does it? I mean, grace is so gentle. Grace is kind. It's, you know, in, in the English, it just gives a smooth, oily, honey word, grace. God's grace is full of the power of God, that same power that raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. When God says to you and me, his grace is sufficient for us, he says it that his power is made perfect in our weakness, then you can believe that all of heaven's resources are going to flow into your experience just as much as you need. What do you need today? to be in that will of God, to play your part, to build the wall, to serve the king in your community. What do you need? God says, my grace is sufficient for you because with his grace comes the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that death and hell could not prevent nor anything stand against. By the grace of God, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the devil will not stand against it. Do you want to be caught up in that mission? Yes, yes, yes. Recruit us for that mission, Lord. Let that be the center of my thinking in the morning and at lunchtime and at tea time. And when I go to my bed, let me be working for the Lord, caught up in the things that play my part with my gifts, with my opportunities in that church being built that the gates of hell cannot stand against. And the devil will flee from you as you do so. John Flavel, a 1600s minister, says, man's extremity is God's opportunity. That's a, a fairly well-known expression. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. The Jews were feeling weak. I think God said, good. 
you're just where I need you to be. In our weakness, his power is made perfect. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For in my weakness, Christ's power rests upon me. Do you feel weak today? Are you feeling weak with the advancement of years? Are you feeling weak because you've worn, you're worn out doing what you have to do day in and day out? God says, my grace is sufficient for you. And when God recruits you in his purpose, you will be fit for purpose, fit for purpose in the grace of God. Don't write yourself off. Don't count yourself out. You're stronger than you imagine. Our evident weakness should cause us to rely on Christ for the victory. If I am weak, therefore, let me cast myself on Jesus. Let me cast my hope on him. Let me cast my failing frame on Christ. Oh, God, strengthen my body. Strengthen my mind. Strengthen my words. Be in my speaking. Be in my living for God's glory. For God's glory. What a theme. The hymn writer says, I love this hymn. Don't you love this one? When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. He giveth more grace. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Yes, we believe. Let's hear our own voices. Faith comes by hearing. It goes into your own ears. Yes, I believe, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this amazing grace. I need to be fast. How did Nehemiah, Nehemiah win the day? He prays, first of all. You may say, well, I kind of expected he would. Yes, he does. And he does when the pressure is on. The pressure is on. We've seen the kind of pressure this dear man was under. And he prays. Do you know, isn't it true for you and I that when we're under real pressure, it becomes the last thing we do that we pray? Isn't that the case? How odd. When we're utterly weak, when we're in panic mode, we don't stop and bring ourselves still before God and say, Lord, I have no idea what to do. I don't, even if I knew what to do, I don't think I can do it. I need your help. I need your help. I need your grace. I need your way forward. And he says, hear us, O God. And he tells God what, exactly what's happening, for we are despised. He doesn't trade insult for insult. He doesn't feel that ire rising up inside him to go and tell Sanballat what he thinks. He doesn't do that. He goes to God with the issue. He sets the city to prayer. Notice what he says, hear us, our God, for we are despised. I think he's got the whole community praying. He's got a, a city-wide day of prayer. Or was it a nation-wide day of prayer? Oh, that we had a nation-wide day of prayer today. Is that not the case? Where our governments were saying, fall down before the Lord and cry out to him for deliverance of all that's happening in our land today. This man knew what to do. The whole of his people were praying. And he tells God they are despised. That is, they are treated despicably. He explains what's happening. And remember, this is in the context of them doing what God has told them to do. Lord, we're doing what you've told us to do. We're rebuilding this wall. And you know what, Lord? These guys are really making us suffer. And the work is being hindered. Your work, oh God, is being hindered. You see, when you're in the will of God, it changes your prayer life. You have confidence before God. When you're in his will, you can say, Lord, you have called me to this. And look at the obstacles that beset us. And the whole team, the whole nation was praying. And all of this we can emulate, Nehemiah. Those who seem to be against you, hand them over to God. Bring the situation before the Lord. As I've hinted, our problem is that the church today is not despised because of its power. It's thought irrelevant because of its paralysis. 
And we each have a contribution to make that this church would not be a paralyzed church because we would be alive, empowered by the Spirit of God, and each of us playing our part in whatever building process God has for us to do. And all of us have a part to play. All of us have a part to play. All of us have a part to play, whatever God shows you that to be. Chuck Smith says, you can do more than pray after you have prayed. <laughs> But you cannot do anything of real spiritual value until you have prayed. I like that. That's great. There's lots for us to do, but first we need to pray. With prayer comes passion or vision. With passion comes power. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do the vision that God gives us. With doing the vision comes productivity or fruitfulness or effectiveness in life. And with that comes praise and glory to God. So having prayed, he keeps building. Verse 6, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. We might have expected it to read, they stopped building to defend themselves against sand ballot. Chuck Smith, who was the founder of the Calvary Chapel movement, he says, I have discovered something in ministry. If I try to defend myself against the attacks that come, God will let me. If I will just turn these attacks over to him, he will defend me. So you have a choice. Defend yourself or let God defend you. Which do you think works best? <laughs> Hallelujah. Nehemiah was on the right road here. So God moves in to deal with the opposition to his will being done. It says that they worked to build the wall to half its height. This was what I thought was a wise interim goal. Um, they, it, it, what it means is that Nehemiah said, look, we're all struggling with this, and we've got another umpteen feet to go. Let's just set, we'll aim for the whole wall at half its height to be completed as soon as we can do it. And suddenly, the finishing line for this part of the work was much closer Spirits were raised, morale was recovered, and they completed the wall to half its height all the way around the city. And we see uh, Nehemiah setting achievable goals for this discouraged and tired community. And they were encouraged by what they could then achieve rather than discouraged by what they could not accomplish. The people worked with all their heart. I'm going to finish on this one. Uh, I haven't got through all of the chapter today, but I've covered most of the themes I wanted to cover. I'm going to finish with this and hand back to Lewis. The people worked with all their heart. I've touched on this already, thinking of how we need to ask ourselves, am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Indeed, do I sense the enemy is concerned when I get out of bed in the morning? Or is he happy leaving me asleep on the sidelines while others are playing the game on the pitch and scoring the goals. Great verse to finish on. Paul says in Romans 12, never be lacking in zeal. The people worked with all their heart. They discovered a new motivation. The mission they were engaged in fired them up and they were passionate about it. It was all consuming. They were not back in Jerusalem for a wee holiday. Maybe it would have been nice to take the day off for a picnic <laughs> if they could have got through the enemy lines. Maybe they had an uncle that stayed just up the road in Jericho. <laughs> but no, this was what their passion was concerned with, this building project. And they worked with all their hearts. You know, we need to be those who are not lacking in zeal. We need to keep our spiritual fervor. This is the words of scripture. Keep your own spiritual fervor. Fervor. We are responsible before God to keep ourselves on fire for the things of Christ. We're responsible to stay on fire for the things of Christ, serving the Lord. You see, we need zeal. We need the zeal of God to consume us. It says of Jesus that the zeal of the Lord consumed him. 
when he went about doing that. I think that was in relation to him clearing the temple. How about that? Making a whip, Jesus did, and he drove the traders out of the temple. You have turned my father's house into a market. And the disciples remembered it is written, the zeal of the Lord consumes me. We are responsible for that zeal lodging, residing in our own breast. We need that Holy Spirit fire that we can be people who are like a lighted taper. And wherever we go, there's a flame that touches and starts a little fire, another little fire, another little bit of burning life from God to those who need his touch in your life and my life as we go out with that zeal, that fire, that passion, that vision, that heart that longs for the things that God longs for. Yes, in our ordinary, simple, everyday lives, it's a question of the heart. Let us make every effort in our prayer life to take our zeal or our lack of zeal before the Lord that we might call out to God that we would become fired up for his mission for our lives. Because when you've got someone who is passionate to serve God and you show them the race they have to run, Lord, I've got all this zeal. What is it you want me to do? And God says, here is your bit. Here is your yoke. It's not too heavy. You can do it. And with zeal, you can say, Lord, let me loose. Let me loose to run this race in such a way to win the prize for you. The people built, worked with all their hearts. Let's be that kind of community. Guys, I love this because so many of you are that kind of community. We're going to have a new building shortly. And we're going to need people with vision and passion and zeal and fire in their hearts for this community, for the wider world. They're going to come to this place and be lighted tapers for people that are going to come to our new cafe that will be open six days a week. And what that cafe is open for is that people might meet you. Why? Because you're full of the fire and the passion and the life of God. And that is what our world needs, God's people on fire, full of Christ, full of grace, full of power. So I must conclude. Time has gone. Uh, if I go to my last slide, which I won't because it's a wee bit away, I'll just leave it. I trust that's been a blessing to us this morning. Let's just pray as we close. Father, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for your word to us today. We just pray that we can learn from Nehemiah how to be men and women who are working under the devil's eye, but winning that battle and glorifying our Father in heaven. For your glory, Lord, we pray these things and share this time together. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Gordon, for that powerful message to us today. If I could just remind you, please, to pray for two things today that I mentioned earlier on. Paul and Doreen's son's father-in-law, Jack Martin, has gone missing after being released from hospital. Please make that a matter of prayer today. And also, uh, this little five-month-year-old girl, Esty Gooding, uh, who's being treated for meningitis and is in a critical condition at this time. So please pray for these two things today. Um, I trust that you've been blessed by being here this morning and that you've enjoyed our service. Uh, and so just as we conclude now, um, I'll, I'll just share a verse with you, Psalm 77, 11, and he died for all that those who live uh, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And I think that's actually the wrong reference because that's probably not in the Psalms. Um, but anyway, that's a verse I'd like to leave with you this morning uh, as we close. So 